Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and we'd like to call the order of the Rutherford County Risk Management Committee. And you've been provided a copy of the minutes for the last meeting. Do we have a motion on those minutes? All right, and a second. Mr. Hafner, anyone have any corrections or additions? If not, everyone in favor, then please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. All right, Mrs. Street, uh, give us an update on our financial statuses. Yes, sir. Um, we'll start with Fund 264, if you look at your report. Um, for the month of April, we ended with revenue at $7.9 million, expenses at 5.6 for a positive variance of $2.3 million. Continuing on to page two of the report. For current calendar year, our revenue is at 26.3 million compared to prior year of 24.2 million with our expenses at 21.9 compared to prior year of 22.1. We also review this information on a fiscal period and currently our revenue is at 52.6 million compared to prior year of 51 million with our expenses at 55.8 with prior year at 55.5. On page three of the report, you'll see in purple the second section, the 2017 calendar year revenue versus expense comparison. And to date, it shows that our revenues at 26.3 with expenses at 21.9 for a positive of $4,321,433. Compared to a fiscal review for the same period of time, shows our revenue at 52.4 million with expenses at 55.8 million for a negative variance of 3.4. And just for the record, we like to look things, at things on the calendar year in risk management. Um, when you look at the net OPEB, which is a new column that's been added to this particular report, so that's our other post-employee benefits, which basically equates to our retiree insurance and future liabilities. Um, we'll add a total col uh, column to that particular box for future reference, but you can see for uh, as of the end of June, the actuarial study shows that the Board of Education will have a future liability of retirees at $76,719,616. The County General will have a liability of $16,401,470 for a total combined OPEB of $93,121,086. Okay, does anyone have questions for Ms. Street? I can proceed with um, Fund 266, if there are no questions on 264. Ending in the month of April, we have eight open workers' comp claims. Um, we have a year-to-date spend of $613,779 compared to the prior year-to-date spend of $495,037. And some of that increase in expenses is due to a um, lifetime medical on a workers' comp, which is why you've seen the increase this year compared to last. Okay, any further questions? Ms. Allen. I, I guess I had uh, I'd never really in my mind made the distinction between on-the-job injury and workers' comp and had... Um, a county employee contacted me recently who has suffered an on-the-job injury and so I'm just will you explain to me our classification how something falls in an on-the-job injury versus workers comp and then how the she's going to be left with a permanent impairment rating but it's my understanding that her benefits will end at one year as opposed to if it had been a work comp claim she would have had lifetime medical so can you kind of talk me through sure. that so um July 1, 2009 is when the county went to um, the on-the-job injury program. It is a return-to-work program versus traditional worker, workers' comp. In the state of Tennessee, government entities can elect to go into what is called the OJI program. It does not have a PPI, which is a permanent uh, impairment rating, like what, you, what you've mentioned. Um, and for the committee, what that means is um, 
if someone has a shoulder injury, as an example, they, they have a range of motion loss as a result of the injury. Under workers' comp, they would apply a percentage to that, and they would receive a lump sum payment as a result of that loss to the range of motion. Under a return to work, um, under OJI, there is not that impairment rating. Therefore, what occurs under our policy is we will provide all the care and services that are needed to that individual along with uh, 66 and two-thirds income um, replacement if they need to be out of work during the time that they're healing from the injury. And we will give them one year of benefit from the date of surgery or the date of accident, whichever occurs later. I see Mr. Good watching me very carefully back there. Uh, raise your hand, Dan, if you feel like there's something important that we need to bring up. Um, and so in, with an individual that has an accident, as an example, um, let's say one of our officers is bitten by a dog. Let's use that one as an example. Then they would go, they would get treated, they'd probably have a follow-up appointment. Unless there's any tendon you know, issues, anything like that, they would return back to work. Their claim would end either a year from the date of the bite, uh, bite or when their employment terminated, should they terminate prior to the end of that year. Let's say that same dog bite occurs and there needs to be some reconstructive surgery on the hand. Um, it would be from the last date of surgery related to the hand from which benefits would exhaust. And so that's, that's the primary difference. The things that we do here in terms of um, complaints from employees is there's no impairment rating, so they no longer get that lump sum. Um, the other thing is that you know they have concerns about the one-year period, but we've done a lot of research, and it predates me as to when the plan was put in place, so Ms. Nolan, Ms. Stevenson may be able to add some commentary about how it was chosen for the direction that we were on. But um, I know there was a lot of research that was done both from a um, actuarial perspective, from a liability and what that, that would look like, uh, as well as um, what other entities do whenever you have this type of benefit in place. And the one year seemed to be pretty conducive with what other entities are doing. And we do research and look at the plan document. We just had a conversation this morning about something we probably need to revisit. But the purpose of the OJI is really to get the employee taken care of and get them back to work is, is the intention of, of the program. So if we're under OJI, then why do we look at workers' comp versus OJI costs? Are these workers' comp that happened prior to the 2009 adoption? Yes, is that, that is correct. And so when there is a lifetime medical, um, we have um, those claims can open and close. Um, since you're on the budget committee, you know that Commissioner Schaefer often asks me how many do we have, and we do continue to see the number decline, but we um, do have claims that are many years old that will open up and that have continued expenses around those for which we are being paid. Um, we have one claim in particular where the county's paid out over $3 million just on that particular claim since the inception date, so some of them can be significant. From a fiduciary responsibility as a commissioner, I completely understand why we would want to adopt this. But I have to say, when I learned that you know somebody's going to have a lingering issue that may require care down the road and they're not going to be covered, that, that was unsettling to me. That doesn't feel like that's the right thing to do. I don't necessarily want to give them a lump sum, but at the same time, I don't know, so it just, it just put a question mark in my mind about why we would want to handle it that way. So. Uh, the Rarely is there one that is not uh, resolved within that one year um, period. There are those, and I can concur with you that it, you know, it makes me feel uneasy as well. But we know that no matter what policy and structure you put in place, there's always going to be that exception. And we try to build programs to address the whole as best that we can. Um, the other issue that you come into, though, is that you know, in an incident where there's a back injury, as an example. Once we've resolved and they've been medically released during that year period, if we had ongoing medical, what's to say that there's not something else that they have done that has precipitated additional injury and the lines become very blurry? And that's, that's really the challenge of maintaining ongoing medical related to some of the injuries that we see on the claims. Any other questions <clears throat> on the financials? Okay, then I think we're ready to uh, 
hear from Mr. Good on the uh, workers' comp slash OJI status. Good afternoon. In the month of April, we had a total of 23 injuries requiring medical attention. On your report, you can see the breakout there. That brings the total for the year to date, January the 1st to the uh, end of April, 73 injuries. Of those 73, 44 were OSHA recordable, 23 had restricted days, 9 lost time days, and 12 others. On the next page of your report, you'll see where it compares this year to the two previous years. The 73 we have this year compared to two previous years. We're up slightly at this time as far as the number of claims. As you look at the next page of the report, though, you'll notice that the incurred dollars are down right now from the two previous years. I always like to remind everybody that incurred dollars are one of those things that fluctuates until the claim matures. It takes about a year for a claim to mature. Uh, the reason being if uh, somebody has a shoulder strain and then later on it's decided that they need to have surgery, then that's going to, of course, incur more dollars. And that's how that, those dollars go up. If they thought the claim was worse or needed more treatment, then obviously it doesn't. Then, of course, the dollars will come down. On the next page of your report, you'll notice that the uh, 23 claims, the total incurred dollars for the month was 29700 Of those claims, 17 of them were with the Board of Education, and the incurred dollars there were 16900 The County General had the other six, and the incurred dollars there were 12800 and the last page of your report breaks down those six for the county general into the departments that they were uh, occurred in. Did, was there any comments that you'd have added to my conversation with uh, Ms. Commissioner Allen about the OJI program? Sorry, what? Or did you have any additional comments about the oh. OJI program you'd like to share? No, I thought it was a very good explanation. It's perfect. I Everything in there. Um, the one thing I did want to add in thought, though, is um, when the county went to the OJI program, we also uh, picked up long-term disability for all employees. So in the event that the six months um, that is available for the 66 and two-third payment ceases and the employee is not fully recovered, then they would pick up under the long-term disability product that the county folded around that in case there is permanent damage that doesn't enable them to come back to work. Um, within that year or within six months or longer. The situation was with the EA, so they wouldn't have been compensated in the summer anyway. Correct. So they wouldn't have gotten the 66 and two thirds, right? That's correct. It's only on days scheduled to work. And then she takes um, short term disability on her own, but again, it wouldn't have covered because it wouldn't have been during a time she would have been scheduled or what should it have covered? Um, that would be something I'd have to go back and look at. It makes clear because it's a workers, it, they still look at it as a workers comp related injury. Yeah. Any questions for Mr. Good? Okay then, thank you sir. Thank you very much. So Mr. Puckett, will you tell us how well we are please? Before Mr. Puckett begins, I'd like to ask Shannon McNair to come up along with Hillary Keene. Mr. Puckett, you can come on up with them as well so you're ready to go whenever they're finished. We've recently added Ms. Keene to our staff at Premise Health, and I'd like for Ms. McNair to introduce her. She always appreciates these impromptu opportunities to address the committee, so I don't want to deprive her of anything. So, Thank you for having us today. Um, you guys know me, Shannon, the health center manager at the MedPoint Clinics. This is Hillary Keene. She just joined us. This is her second, no, third week on the job. Third? Second second week on the job and she is already scheduling and starting to see patients at all three of our clinics so please make sure you guys put it out there that she's already in and I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit about herself. Um, like she said, I'm Hillary Keene, the new wellness coordinator. Um, background, I actually went to MTSU, got my master's degree in exercise science here. Uh, I've worked at Vanderbilt, worked um, with a doctor referral system in Jackson, Tennessee for the last couple of years. So very familiar with clinical populations and 
um, working with the overall total wellness. So excited to work in more of a little bit of a corporate, see a little bit of a different population um, that are still trying to reach the same goals as those clinical populations. So send people my way. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much, ladies. Mr. Puckett. Good afternoon. Well, I'm back to being single again. Last month I was <laughs> Mr. Perry and I'm back. But uh, quick wellness update. Last month we had the St. Thomas, Thomas mobile mammography bus on May 8th and 9th in Blackman. We had 24 participants in that. So a pretty good turnout there. Know Your Numbers is continuing on. We've done 1,461 uh, biometric screenings and 838 uh, online health assessments. Kind of sum that up. That's 17% of the total population um, for the online health assessment, and we're at 30% for the biometric screenings. Um, we did do our promotion last month for the Yeti coolers. Um, unfortunately, we didn't see as many people as we did the month prior to that. I guess iPads are, are, are more fun than uh, Yeti coolers, but um, still we're up from last year, which is good. So we're getting uh, some more participation early, which is what we want. Um, we don't have any coaching numbers as of yet. We'll have some of those next month. Our current and upcoming events, Walk Across America is still going on. We have a lot of people that are participating in that. They're out moving and things, and I'll be happy to share those results with you next month. Um, our life services EAP this month is about raising well-adjusted kids. I'm sure my mom would have liked to have attended that um, all those years ago. Um, that's available to you until the end of this month. Um, one last thing I do want to mention that's not on here, but we'll talk about it next month, is the DI conference uh, for the teachers in July. What we're going to do this year is we're actually going to offer from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. both days. Um, on-site biometric screenings. So for those teachers who want to come early and do their biometric screening, get it knocked out there, it's all taken care of. They don't have to go to med point, stand in line as the deadline approaches. So um, more communication will come about that next month and we'll kind of talk through that. But uh, if you could just spread the word about all of that stuff, we would greatly appreciate it. But if you guys don't have any questions, that's all for me. So for those of you all that missed last month, uh, inadvertently I had uh, made his name Daniel Perrin. Um, Kelly Perrin happens to be married to Daniel Perrin and out of habit of type Perrin, so that's, that's why he's saying he's back to being single. Actually, Kelly called and insisted I get it right this month, so I made sure I did that. <laughs> kind of hurts my feelings, but I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Broker services, we'll let Ms. Street sort of introduce this person and Okay. So I asked Mr. Um, Lou Diaz to come up from Willis Towers Watson. Um, we, last March 2016, implemented a new broker contract. Previously, we had, you can come on up. Um, we want to give you the whole f full 15 minutes of fame up here. Um, <laughs> we had implemented a broker contract, and previously we had, um, utilized Cowan benefits frequently because they had been awarded as broker of various products that we had um, put out to bid. And through that process, once they acquired various products, um, they stepped up and started assisting in ways that a traditional broker would do. So we issued an RFP so that we could formalize that process. Um, there was a committee um, that was involved in the interview and selection process, and Willis uh, was awarded the contract in the end. So I've asked that he come today to um, educate us about the differences and what we may be seeing now versus before. Um, we are utilizing the broker um, as much as possible in ways that we would not have used them previously. And so I just want to um, address that and allow him to, to say, yes, this is what we do, this is what you can expect from us, and this is what we've done thus far and what we're going to do in the future just to paint a better picture for us as we have entered into this new broker arrangement, because it had been quite some time since we had a formal broker arrangement in place in the county. So with that long introduction, there yeah. you go. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you all for the time today. Um, we'll, we'll skip right to page two, just uh, uh, discussion topics in regard to what we're going to talk about who our team is. Um, as Melissa mentioned, my name is Lou Diaz. I'm with Willis Towers Watson. I'm the senior consultant for Rutherford County. Uh, we'll also review the current and upcoming work, our working relationship with Melissa. Um, as she mentioned, this is more of a partnership. It's just understanding the needs of Rutherford County, working closely together, and then us providing best practices of what we see in county government. 
Um, and then we'll go through our resources and capabilities quickly. So first, uh, our team, our leadership team, um, Eric McMurray, who is my boss, um, heads the South Region, myself, Senior VP, Lead Consultant for Rutherford County, uh, Kelly Derrick, who's in the room, uh, she's the uh, Client Service Lead, and then Alden Davenport, who you've seen before, also heads our Financial Department. So on page four, uh, some of the work that we've done uh, and will be doing in the near future. Um, as it comes to welfare plans, health and welfare plans, obviously that's the largest expense for Rutherford County. So we help uh, with the help of Melissa and her team issued and evaluate um, the 2017 RFP. So that's our request for proposal from the marketplace uh, for medical RX, stop loss, dental and vision uh, for 2018. Um, we also coordinated and facilitated finalist meetings, so we brought those vendors in so we had an opportunity to vet them out uh, to see who may be the best solution for Rutherford County moving forward. Um, we're also, we evaluated the retiree uh, program and we will continue to, to evaluate the retiree program in the future, uh, but we did do that this past year. In regard to compliance, everybody's aware of the Affordable Care Act and uh, its impact to us as well. Um, so we provide training, HIPAA training, and risk management and HR staff to the HR staff at Rutherford County. Um, we also provide legal opinions. Now we can't sign off on those um, because um, you're not part of our company, but our attorneys can get it to the point to where it's easily signable and reviewed by your internal counsel. Um, we also provide uh, compliance when it comes to ACA as well. Um, financial and analytics, Alden Davenport, as I mentioned before, um, creates a monthly deliverable for cost versus accrual or premium um, so that we can evaluate where we are today. Um, you know, we attend all the monthly financial meetings for Rutherford County um, and the committee. And then in the last year, we evaluated the prior program that was in place. Um, Alden had a big piece in this, or the consultant, the previous consultant had some different rates in there, and we adjusted those. Um, and, it, and it resulted in a $2 million recruitment overall for Rutherford County. Um, we feel pretty good and solid about our, our renewal rates for 2017 and 2018. Um, other projects that we're going to continue to evaluate, as I mentioned, we have a, with our merger with Towers Watson, if you don't remember, we, we were Willis before, for those who don't know, um, merged with Towers, uh, Towers Watson in 2016. Um, with that, Towers was more of an analytical company, um, so they had all the benchmarking, um, analysis of plans, disability, RX, et cetera. Uh, with that, we get all those tools as well now. Um, so we are looking at providing more benchmarking studies for uh, Rutherford County in the near future, um, and then um, providing those as a baseline to what we can do and, and differences we can make to the plan. Um, we also coordinate and secure $40,000 from Unum uh, for a technology credit, and then obviously we do the print and open enrollment communications, um, and then we participate in the annual wellness fair. So on page five, it, please don't get caught up in the quarters here, but it, we, we basically break our relationship up into four quadrants, um, strategy and planning, analysis, measurement, and pricing, implementation and enrollment, enrollment and contracting. So that's kind of our relationship throughout the year. It doesn't just stop uh, once open enrollment is done. We continue on in looking at ways that we can make a difference in keeping the cost down ultimately. Um, and we work very, very closely with Melissa and her team. Um, so we'll do strategic planning meetings, uh, marketplace updates, utilization, identify new opportunities that we see um, not only in county governments but demographically and geographically in the state of Tennessee. Um, and then from there, we'll obviously manage the renewals, uh, benchmarking plans, uh, model alternatives uh, to see if there are other opportunities out there uh, that make sense and then draft budget rates. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, we do negotiate all the vendors or at least provide the RFP with Melissa, with the help of Melissa and her team, um, and then prepare for the mayor of the budget uh, projections for those. Um, and then we go through the process all over again the following year. 
one of the leverage um, aspects of having a, a formal broker relationship is beneficial to our employees as well. So as an example, if we have an employee that has an ancillary product and we're having difficulty in getting the claim paid or getting issues resolved, um, we'll kick that off to Ms. Derrick and she will then um, leverage with that particular vendor to help get the solution that we need. Um, when we are a singular entity, even though Rutherford County is considered a large employer group, um, we don't always have the weight with the with the vendor the way that we need to. And by vendor, I mean the insurance company. But their book of business is significantly larger and therefore we benefit from that uh, with their ability to get them to do the right thing whenever they are pushing back on us, so. Um, we'll go to page six. And, and again, this is just an overview of some of the tools that we have access to. Um, some of the things that we'll be doing in the near future are the healthcare financial benchmarking survey. And this is, uh, this takes into all city government, um, government entities throughout the United States kind of shows you where you are today and, and where they are and some innovative uh, things that they're doing within their plan to see if we might be able to implement those in the future. Um, and then best practices, we're always looking at, you know, what are others doing that could make a difference here, whether it's in the government sector or outside of the government sector. Um, so these are just a list of, of some of the tools that we have available to us. Um, some of these we won't do right away. Uh, we will do over a period of time, but it really is in essence to keep the cost down and do what's right for the county and the employees of the county long term. Now, page seven, obviously our promise to Rutherford County is to uh, to continue our partnership with a dis uh, disciplinary team who knows Rutherford County is prepared to take it to the next level of high performance with new resources and expertise because this market is changing so quickly of those who don't know. I mean, the um, trend itself is eight to 10%. Our job is to keep that trend level below five um, and ultimately at zero. Um, cutting edge innovation back to some of the benchmarking and analytics that we have at, um, available to us and then to Melissa's point, our leverage in the marketplace with all the vendors and carriers. Um, it gives us the opportunity to put you in the best position moving forward. Um, benchmarking, reporting and analytics capabilities, uh, we've talked a little bit about that. Those will all be a part of what we're doing in our ongoing relationship with Rutherford County. Um, and then obviously transparent and cost effective. Um, the one thing that we've always been as a transparent company, you know exactly what we make, how we make it, um, and then the ROI that's delivered at the end of that process. So um, page eight is our scope of service. And I won't go through each one of these. I kind of went through them briefly on the following pages. But this is for uh, FYI for you to kind of know that this is the commitment we made to Rutherford County, all the services that we will provide, the financial data analytics, the strategic development with Melissa and her team. Um, page nine, renewal and placement, kind of talked about a little bit about that and our leverage in the marketplace. Um, implementation and enrollment, open enrollment guides, um, providing uh, the opportunity to speak with the members of Rutherford County to ensure that their coverages are being taken care of properly. And page 10, account management, back to Kelly and her team. They do a great job of managing that process. So if there are any questions, if, if a, to Melissa's point, if a claim needs to be resolved quickly, then it allows us the ability to go to those carriers and, and leverage our relationship to ensure that it's prayed properly. And then page 11, um, with, with us, you have access to what we call subject matter experts in each one of these five quadrants, um, which are compliance, um, ACA, FMLA, um, you name it, any acronym you want to think of on that side, we, we've got it covered. Um, we also have HR consulting, HR partners who um, outside of benefit related questions, um, total rewards, we can assist in that. Um, obviously the wellness program and communication and reporting and analytics. And lastly, on page 12 is our gap assessment. So one of the things that we always do with all of our clients is, you know, we try to figure out, okay, where are areas that we can help? Um, and this kind of goes through how we go through that process, whether it's HR, communication, compliance, health outcomes, et cetera. 
So one of the things that's been helpful in our department is the uh, compliance aspects. We've utilized them frequently for questions regarding ACA clarification of our processes and procedures, and as well as our COBRA processes that we have in place. And we've, util we've utilized the attorneys that he referenced as well. Even though we are a non-ERISA policy uh, program, we follow along with the same guidelines for most aspects. And so there have been a couple of occasions over the last year where I've asked them to look into different things that I needed an attorney to opine on even though they won't say this is what you should do they give you enough information to let you make a decision that you can feel pretty solid about doing and so that that's been a great benefit um, Hudson Reed and McQuarrie does not have an ERISA specialist on staff and um, at times when I have needed that we've had to look at outsourcing that and we, we no longer have that because of, of this contract so that's been a big addition for us When you talk about clinical and financial reporting, the analytics and health outcomes, do you go specifically down to um, the provider level when you talk about best practices? Because I'm thinking, you know, not all doctors are created equal. Yeah, <laughs> and no, so is that's that part point. of what you're identifying or some of who the best providers are so, so that maybe we can begin to help our employees go that route? Yeah, that's part of it, absolutely. So we, we look at a number of things. So it's not, it's employee-based. Obviously, it's what we see uh, within within Rutherford County and the employee base. But then, obviously, looking at, okay, what are some of the best, um, not only in pricing, in and around here from, yeah, from physicians to hospitals um, to imaging programs and then creating communication around that so that we're effectively putting all of our employees in the best possible care position, not only responsibly for best care, but financially for long term for Rutherford County. Yeah, good question. Mr. Davenport has, actually gets a direct information from Cigna. He has access um, to a lot of the same information that I have, and so he's able to see what our claims look like and, and things like that from a financial perspective, and so he's able to monitor and make recommendations based on what he sees there. Other questions for Mr. Diaz? Hi. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, okay, sure. Question. Um, I was looking under financial and data analytics on page eight. Yeah. Um, the third thing that it says is, no, the fourth, is that um, you provide clinical and financial reporting through Willis Med at the member level. Hmm? And that this member information is sometimes shared in or used in conjunction with third party contracts. So the so individual. Inform medical information is shared with third parties. No, never. No, no. no okay. that's, Can you explain that to me then? So the, the data is, is stripped of anything that has to do with PHI. So while we can look at what disease state any person is in, we have no idea who that person is generally. We just look at it as an overall view of the population itself. Um, our, our data analytics tool strips out anything that has to do with PHI. Um, the carriers actually well, yeah, most of the time, yeah, before we get it. And Alden can kind of speak to that, too. But, I mean, we, we typically get the data stripped of anything um, pertinent, unless it's a large claim, obviously, and we need to kind of figure out, okay, where, where are we in regard to reimbursement or payment in regard to a large claimant. Uh, but we're not, we're not sharing anything that's delivered to us with any third party outside of what we're doing, especially with any PHI. Even the information that's shared with the county direct from Cigna is all de-identified so that I may know it's a 49-year-old female with this diagnosis, you know, but I have no clue who the individual is um, as well to kind of speak to his point. Caught my attention because it says that sometimes the people will be requ required to sign a client addendum and that sometimes protected health information is shared. So I wanted to make sure I asked about that. No, it's a, it's a great point, and I, and I think it's probably just a disclaimer that we have to put in everything that we do just in case we receive information, but we never share this outside of our office in regard to third-party information. And if it is, to Melissa's point, it's stripped of any identifiers that could go back to any individual. Good question. Okay, then, sir, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Open enrollment, Mrs. Street. So last time um, we had discussion brought up by Ms. Barnes regarding the open enrollment process. 
Um, there's two. <clears throat> there's two processes. One of two processes happens during open enrollment. You have an active enrollment, which basically says everyone goes in. If they want medical next year, they have to go in, elect medical, submit it to the administrator. If they fail to do that, then their medical ends at the end of the calendar year at midnight. The other is a passive enrollment. Passive is when you don't go in and do anything, you just get the same benefits that you're enrolled in in the prior year come January 1. So I provided you open enrollment results for the last three years, and I'll explain how to interpret this to you. Um, in 2015, we had a passive enrollment, so employees weren't required to go in and um, log in to maintain their medical. We had 5,170 employees. We had 4,000 that were eligible for medical benefits um, the following year. We had um, 4,539 that actually logged in and completed open enrollment. So that leaves a difference of 631 employees or 12.21% that did not go in. Now of the 631, who did not access the benefit system, 158 of those had insurance in that year. So therefore, um, they that's a 3% that said, okay, I'm just going to let my benefits roll over as is. I'm not going to do anything. Therefore, my current elections will continue on on January 1 during the open enrollment process. During uh, the next year, we went to active enrollment so that we could capture reason codes for declines. Um, under ACA, we are to capture information about, you know, if someone has other insurance or, or the purpose of which they are declining that, inf that coverage. And that was the reasoning for us beginning to train the behavior of going in and doing active enrollment so that we could capture that information in the event that we began being required to report that information. So in 2016, we had 5,713 active eligible employees. 5,334 went in during the annual enrollment period and completed annual enrollment. That leaves a difference of 379 individuals, or 6.63%. Of the 379 that did not go in, 88%, 88 of them had insurance during the year prior to um, 2016, and therefore they would have had insurance terminate at midnight on 2015, and when January 1st, 2016 came, they had no medical. They had, they had their other benefits with the exception of flexible spending accounts because by law you have to go in annually and elect for that, but they would not have had medical. Again, last year we required active enrollment. We had 5,950 individuals eligible for um, insurance beginning January 1st, 2017. 5,502 accessed the system. Uh, that leaves a difference of 448 people. Of the 448, 101 of them were enrolled during 2016 and lost coverage January 1st, 2017 which is less than 1% because they did not go in and complete the open enrollment process. Go ahead, Mr. Sammy. Would... Yeah, not, we're, just, we're just looking at, we're not comparing to previous year, I'm just looking at the 101 compared as a percentage of the, I'm sorry, of the 5,950. I believe, okay. I believe that's 1.7% on the last line here? Yes, ma'am. Of the 5950, yeah, I just want to make sure that's what we had actually calculated off of. So we're at, we're at 101 individuals, the mayor says it's 1.7% of the 5950. So the conversation today is whether or not we want to continue doing an active process or do we want to go to a passive enrollment? We had issues with um, individuals who had, as I indicated last time, who had the habit of uh, deleting Ms. Barnes' emails when they would go out without reading them, and therefore, uh, under Microsoft Office, it identifies that as clutter, and every time an email, regardless of subject, is sent by Ms. Barnes, 
it automatically moves that email into clutter. They have since turned that process off. I don't know if, have they started it again, Ms. Barnes, are you aware? No, no clutter is still turned off. Okay. Um, and so of the ones that we talked to at the Board of Education, um, and that obviously due to size, that's the vast majority of them. We did have a couple of people within County General, but the majority were Board of Education uh, individuals. Um, that seemed to be a, a common theme that we would hear about why they had not completed it. Now we do a save the date postcard. We mail out the full packet of information to the home address on file. We even send out an email prior to the postcard being sent um, telling them to contact Human Resources to update their email address, or I mean their home address if, it's, if they've moved um, and have not updated that information to try to ensure that the packet and the postcard arrives where it needs to. And then we send out, I don't know, six emails or so, reminders during that period. We let them know, hey, it starts here. We send out a couple a week. Um, so it's, maybe it's more like five, five to six, something like that, um, to encourage them, remind them about um, technical support not being available on weekends, the deadline at noon, and you know, we try to stay out there for them. Um, we go out to the highway department, remind those folks about it. Um, anyone that asks us to come, we'll be glad to do that. We do webinars as well during that period. So the, the school board had requested that this be brought up during the insurance meeting and Ms. Barnes uh, did that last month. And so now we need to discuss this as a committee and decide what course of action we wanna take in open enrollment years going forward. If it's open for discussion, let me just ask one question that may not be a good question. From go, going from passive to active, is this somehow producing some sort of positive result by making them go through these questions, et cetera, to consider maybe whether they're in the right plan or whether they really want to make changes? Is, is there some benefit well, the from passive to active, that process? The assumption is that yes, for the very reason that you just said, you would expect people to actually look at the materials, um, pay attention to what the rate increases are, what the benefits um, are, and to, to make informed decisions, whereas when they uh, have passive enrollment, at that point they will uh, more likely become creatures of habit and just say, you know, I'll still have my insurance and they won't actually go in and, and look at it. And this passive group of 158, it wasn't that they lost their insurance, they, they automatically carried over under the same coverage, right? Correct, that is correct. And Mr. Sent, but Mr. And Sandy. I was just gonna say, and one thing I've said to Ms. Barnes is, you know, there, there's not gonna be a fail-proof answer. If we go passive, guess what? I've, we've been in, in passive years more than 15, we just did a three-year look back, and inevitably I'll get calls with people complaining because there was a rate increase and they didn't know it and had they paid attention, they would have gone in and elected a different insurance plan. So no matter which decision we make, there's still, it's not gonna satisfy everyone just based on experience. What, in some of the discussions we've had, one of the things that rather concerned me, it, we were directing people who did not uh, enroll, well, tell them, well, you can get a plan under the ACA and then drop it or go in, go to the, the, the marketplace, pick up a plan, drop it, and then come back into ours. I don't know that that drill is very productive for anyone. Well, so under uh, special enrollment laws, what it says is if you have loss of coverage, you have a birth, a death, uh, marriage, anything like that. So when someone calls in to our office, we explain to them what special enrollment means so that they understand. And th they'll, you know, through that conversation, they'll say, so what if I have insurance and I voluntarily drop it? Yes, if you go out and you get an insurance product and we do not direct them anywhere in particular to go um, actually get that insurance product, but if you have insurance, 
uh, an insurance product, there's not a minimum period requirement. Um, it would actually would be 30 days because it would have to be an active enforced product. Um, and you lose that coverage either through voluntary or involuntary service then um, action. Then within 30 calendar days from the date that you lose that coverage under special enrollment, you can come back to to the Rutherford County plan. So it's not that we are, you know, just creating an exercise as, you know, for them to go through that it's, that's what the law says is that through loss of coverage, they can come back. So we do educate them as to various opportunities that they would have throughout the year prior to the next annual enrollment because those benefits wouldn't take place on January 1. I've wondered, are we better off going with a passive re-enrollment, even making the HRA the default? If you do not go in and opt for whatever we, you, you are re-enrolled in the HRA with your same dependents, if you do nothing, I can, which would um, upset some people, I realize. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that, um, you know, it's very difficult in our office after open enrollment. Um, people get so belligerent and out of line with myself and my employees that I often wonder if they realize that we all work for the same employer. I've never worked anywhere else in my career where I've been spoken to the way that I have been spoken to after open enrollment. And it takes a lot of gumption to sit there and listen to the way that we are treated. And it's not just the employees that call. We get spouses that call. Um, it's, you know, I've just never been in an environment where it can be tolerated the way that it is. Um, and if we are going to make it passive, then that is for the benefit of the employee. It should reduce some of the discussions that we will have, as I indicated, we will continue to still have those. But um, I would ask that you all not move their, po their policy to a different plan because then if you have somebody that's on a certain medication and now you've moved to the HRA, it can be financially detrimental to them. Um, I'd much rather just leave it be the way that it is. Ms. Barnes. Okay, I have several things to say. First of all, I do want to applaud risk management because I know the open enrollment period is extremely intense and we communicate throughout that entire two to three week, four week period and have conversations daily about things that are going on and conversations that we have with employees. So it is hard. Um, I also understand, and we've said this before, it is absolutely the employee's responsibility to go in and make these elections for themselves and their family. And there's no denying that that is a fact. But I also know that errors occur. And that's the thing I'm trying to remedy here and bring to everybody's attention is that even if somebody makes a human error, they are still a benefit eligible employee who has existing coverage. And I think the right thing to do is allow them to continue that coverage rather than be penalized and, and punished, if you will, to drop that coverage because I said before it's an extremely devastating situation when you do lose coverage. I agree with Ms. Street that if they stay on their existing plan, then that eliminates some of the issues that we have after enrollment, the conversations that you have to have with employees. If we change the plan, it draws a little bit more attention to the conversations you're going to have, but when you eliminate the plan altogether, that's when we have conversations, and I know the mayor has those conversations, we have those conversations, and so that's why I've asked to bring this to the table, to um, consider the employee who is already eligible for those benefits, who has existing benefits, and just allow them to continue. So I'd like to put a motion on the table, if I may. Any time you may. Wait a minute, what's your motion? I'd like to make a motion to continue the existing plan for employees and existing dependents as the default medical insurance option at open enrollment for any Rutherford County eligible employee who is enrolled in the Rutherford County medical insurance plan and fails to log in during open enrollment during that deadline period. And a second. I comment, sir. Can I comment? Oh, yeah, comments, questions. So I, w I would caution on the language because existing, existing dependents, um, it should read existing eligible dependents because if you have a dependent that ages out, they need to come off the insurance. Yeah. 
All right, or if the spouse starts to work or whatever. Uh, Mr. Marlin. I understand the concerns of, you know, somebody losing their medical coverage. That's got to be devastating. I think, though, we'll, that we're taking a step backwards by doing this. I think that in today's world, you have to be a consumer of your health care. You have to go in and log in. You have to understand your plan. Your plan may need to be changed, your dependence, your situation. Um, if we expect to be able to be a consumer of it, we've got to know what's going on. We've got to be thinking about our biometrics and know your numbers, know your cholesterol level, know your heart rate, know what your risk factors are, what you may need to go in and get checked out that year. And I think if we don't, if you look at the numbers, we got 5,502 people that are doing the right thing. We're changing this for 101 people. And uh, I just don't think it's a benefit to us to do that. We're, we're going, in my opinion, we're going backwards. We're not, we're not keeping up with what we should be doing as far as educating our, um, our people in the county to go in and be uh, healthier, uh, to looking at their plan, adjusting their plan, and making those changes that they need to. I, th I think we're gonna go back. We'll probably go back to 2015 and we'll have 631 people that won't even go in. I just don't think that's the way we need to go. That's that's my opinion. I think we I think we go and continue on, and that we um, maybe set a deadline a week before, and then find those 101 people that didn't do it, and have them go in and do it the week that it's due. I mean, the, your managers in each one of your departments go around to those people and and sit down with that person and have them do it. Uh, that's the way I would go with it instead of changing the plan. I would, I would do, something, um, do something like that to where we, have, we continue with our plan, but we give them the opportunity a week before the deadline to make sure they get it done. I mean, we owe that to them. That's doing the right thing, but it keeps us on our plan moving forward. Mr. Bowles. I can say from many years of HR experience, and I'm not a county employee, but uh, I can say that employees would appreciate the passive enrollment. Um, they would see that as a plus. It would be a lot more than just 101. It would go beyond that. Many of your employees would rather have passive employment. I feel certain, I don't know the Rutherford County employees, but just knowing a lot of people in general, um, I feel like uh, they would appreciate that option. Ms. Stevenson. So just two observations. One, when we had the passive, and, and I agree that it should be considered as a benefit for the employees if we had the passive. But as you see uh, from the data, when we had the passive, we had even more people that didn't enroll than we did when we were having the active. But the other thing that I'm going to say is probably not going to be received real favorably, but we are adults and we're dealing with adults. And if you don't make your house payment, you pay a penalty. If you don't make your car payment, you make a penalty. Um, if a teacher assigns a homework assignment and the child didn't turn it in, they get a zero. So I don't, either there needs to be, it can't always be risk management's fault that somebody loses their benefit. It's not risk management's fault, we as adults, have a responsibility and I, I'll, I'm sitting here and I'll probably forget to do my next year and you know be like freaking out but the fact of the matter is it would be my fault it's not their fault they send the packets to the home they send a, a postcard in advance to get in the packet they send out an email every week I mean short of going one by one everybody gets this information it's not their fault so at some point in time we've got to make sure that we're ensuring some accountability within our employees. I mean, I'm an advocate for the employees, but I'm also an advocate for them stepping up and doing the right thing and being accountable for their own actions. So if we did something different, I think there should be a penalty involved. If we're gonna say that we're gonna allow extra time or I don't know, and maybe that's not an avenue that we wanna go down, but I'm just saying in life, if you have other bills or um, requirements or those type things in order to maintain something, there is some penalty involved. I don't know. Maybe that's wrong. 
So, Mr. Marlin, I, I heard you just say that perhaps the beginning of the last week of the annual enrollment period, we would send out a list that says, here's all the employees that haven't completed annual enrollment. Identify your employees and talk to them. We do send out an email specifically to the directors, department heads, and to principals that say, please get with your employees and ensure that they've completed it. Ms. Barnes and I have had this discussion before about, okay, is it necessary for us to actually pull the list when every department manager knows who all of their employees is and it's just a matter of touch and base and saying, did you get it done? Um, we have done the list in the past years as well. Um, I know that in, it was 13, I think I had looked back that far, 14, one of those years, I stumbled across one of those emails I'd sent Ms. Barnes. So we have, we've tried multiple things over, over the years as well. Okay, let's, Mr. Hafner and then Ms. Allen. I, I don't disagree with anything that anybody said. I mean, everybody's pointing out some really good things about we ought to hold people accountable, but you know, this isn't like an employee that's late or not doing their jobs correctly, and, and we hold them accountable for that. This is something that they failed to sign up for a benefit. It's not part of their job. It may be part of their responsibility, but it's not part of their job. And what is the punishment for that, that they have no insurance for their family? I mean, that's not a, that's not a fair punishment for, for somebody that's done something wrong. And then let's point out the fact that there's so many ways around this. All you got to do is sign up for a, for an insurance plan for 30 days, and then you come into the plan. So, you know, I know people that have done that. So why are we making them jump through hoops? Just let it be passive. It's a good way to reach out to our employees and let them know that we care, and just let, them, let it be a passive like it was a few years ago. It's a simple fix. So why do we, Mr. Hafner, then just automatically re-enroll them, don't even have open enrollment? What's the purpose of it? I, I'm okay with that. It's, what, it's uh, got to have some I purpose. Is this by law or something? So you have to allow an annual period that people can go in and make, make changes. So by law, we do have to do that. Now, I do tell you I take offense to the terminology of jump through hoops. Um, and the reason I say that is because it's certainly not the intention, and we actually go above and beyond in the education process by ensuring that they understand all the special enrollment criteria that would enable them to come back onto the insurance. Um, we do deal heavily with the displacement of responsibility when it doesn't happen. Um, it's never the employee's fault, ever. Um, no matter how many times we've said it or how we've done it, you would be amazed at what we hear. Did you get the white envelope, the big white envelope? I did. It's sitting on my pen at home. I haven't even opened it. Okay, well, that's what you needed. I mean, and so ultimately it's the committee's decision um, on what to do. Um, but I just, I just want to make sure that it does come across that we, you know, we are required to do this by law. Special enrollment exists. It is a law. We educate them to help to combat the issue that they've created for themselves. Um, yes, if the employee does their job, that's fantastic. But the employee also has to manage to get to work on time and take care of other personal things that are related to the, their job and the benefit of receiving a paycheck. And so it certainly would make my life a lot easier to do the passive. I just don't know if that's it's necessarily the right passive. thing. It makes a lot of people's lives a little easier. But we don't do send that. out anything except the envelope, and we won't send any rem reminder emails out every week and count and communicate. I mean, they're we're spending a lot of anyway. energy on this. They're going to get it anyway. They're just going to they're going to just do a 30-day policy, and they're going to get it anyway. And none of those people that called me even knew about that option. <laughs> Ms. Allen. I just have a couple of questions. Um, one of the things that you said was when we went from passive to active, it was to capture some ACA information that you thought potentially would need to be recorded. Right. Of course, we don't know what the future of ACA is, but so what is lost by going back to passive on that ACA? The, on the ACA, we just won't have the reason for why they've, they've declined our coverage. Right now, they're, they'll give a declination reason. It's not a requirement yet, but you just anticipated that it would be. It, it actually was um, several years ago, whenever we first started looking at the ACA language, it was brought up that we would have to capture that information, and that's when we started um, moving in that, that category. Um, the other, or in that process, the other thing that just came to mind, though, as you resurfaced this issue is the um, 
the self-report process for spousal eligibility. And if they're not going in, they're not in their, they don't even open their packet as a reminder of, hey, if my spouse works, then that would be a time that we would lose that as well. And I have already talked to uh, Willis about, we're gonna need to look to find a vendor that can do this. There's not a lot that do from the employment perspective um, for spouse eligibility, but we will have to then at that point um, get more assertive about finding somebody and doing a bid process so that we can get individuals um, reviewed to make sure that their spouses are actually eligible. On that spouse piece, this is, wasn't part of my questions, but you just made me think of it as well. On that spouse piece, could you let employees know that at some point you may do, they may be selected by random audit? So if you don't have time to check all 5,000 employees, could you let them know, be aware, follow the rules, or if you get caught, you're going to lose There's never a punishment if they're caught. I can just tell you that. We take them off the insurance, but in terms of anything else, that's... Oh, that's what I meant, was just, yeah. yeah, if you're caught, you lose your coverage. That, right. was, that is do, a big consequence. We put language in there that, you know, about it is an ethics issue and such, but we do remove them once we find out, um, back to the date that we learned that they were actually uh, eligible for insurance elsewhere. What we do also, uh, if with any new hire that comes in outside of annual enrollment, we uh, if a spouse is added during annual enrollment, then at that point, um, they have to provide, uh, you know, we'll, we'll information about spousal eligibility to our office through the dependent verification process, but it's only during, if they roll over from one year to another, that we wouldn't um, have them do that. And you started to answer my second question, which was, is, wouldn't the passive be better for your department overall? I would think if you would get fewer complaints that my rate went up, but I still have coverage, then, oh my gosh, I don't have coverage. But, but kind of part B to that question is, what are, what are the negative effects overall from a risk management standpoint? Are there any negative effects that we're not considering besides just the convenience of a passive? Um, the only thing that is that they don't review in the passive to look at what the rates are, what the plan options are. If we make a plan change, um, we change certain limits within a plan, they won't be aware of them, so then there's going to be frustration down the road. Um, yeah, either, either way, we'll still deal with some issues. I would hope that under passive, the assertiveness of the individuals calling in would decline based over what we have seen. But like based on what Mr. Marlin said in terms of know your numbers, biometrics, all that, is there, the fact that some of them won't be doing that, is that an overall negative effect on risk management? Well, that, we do separate communications about that as well through email and other various entities. And actually, we have separated out the know your numbers campaign from the actual annual enrollment process because the deadlines were confusing to people. So Ms. Barnes had suggested that last year, I think it was the first year we did it. So they have to actually have the, the um, biometric screening completed by the end of September and annual enrollment is always in October. And then this is just my last thought. I, I really feel like just as an employer, as a county, we need to update our communication process. Um, you know, I'm, like, I'm as guilty as everybody else. If somebody sends me an email, I tell them, send me a text and tell me to check my email. <laughs> so text messaging, it's very easy to have a mass text messaging system. Almost everybody has it. If you don't have it, you probably have a coworker who has it who said, hey, did you get this? And then from the school standpoint, they have the automated call system. So I, I don't, I know families are in it. I don't know about employees, but I would also think in terms of communicating, um, I'm just thinking even like snow days if you want to communicate with your department and say hey don't come in or hey come two hours late I just think I think that's an opportunity we really need to explore that could just help all of us so we didn't uh, do the call out last year during annual enrollment we had done them um, at least the prior year and maybe two years prior I recall that we did that Miss Barnes is a good partner to our department she's always very helpful uh, during the annual enrollment process. We, um, like within County General, I can do an all user email and I can blast it out from my desktop. The Board of Education requires that I send it to Ms. Barnes and then it goes out through Ms. Barnes to the Board of Education employees. Um, so we don't capture information so that we would be able to do a text blast or, or anything like that. We did attempt to upgrade our benefit system to have more of the technology. Unfortunately, the numerous payrolls and uh, 
the way data feeds from local gov, the, the fact that we collect premium in June to pay benefits through August for um, certified teachers, those issues really made it difficult for us to move into a different platform over what we're in today. My only follow-up thought to that is I think if people knew they had an option to opt in to text messaging to get communication, I think they would. I know I certainly prefer it, I, and it's just easier that way as well, yeah. Young lady. Lady right here. Oh, you want, you're going to yield to Ms. Barnes? Brown, I think. I just wanted to add my two cents. As a teacher, I understand that, you know, if a student doesn't do their work, they get a zero, but we don't kick them out of school. Our students are better off with an education. Our employees are better off with insurance. They're healthier with insurance. They're financially healthier if they get to keep their insurance because they can afford it if something catastrophic happens. They're also healthier because they can go to the doctor when they're sick. So I'm for passive enrollment. If I may. Is Dr. Barnes. I promise. I do want to say that with Rutherford County Schools you know we will continue our efforts to push this out to our employees in every platform that we have possible to us. We already have plans this year. We've talked about what we'll do in October and what we're currently doing with the Know Your Numbers campaign because it is important for employees to go in and read and review and make those informed decisions. But I will also say that with us having up to 5,000 employees, it is very difficult for human resources to make that connection with all of those employees because we're not privy to that information that would have to come from risk management to make that contact. Uh, smaller departments have the availability to call in their 50 or 100 employees and have conversations. Did you get this done? Is it all finished? We don't have that opportunity. We have to rely on those mechanisms of social of media to get out to the people and remind them, but we don't have that personal contact. So once again, I thank you for having this discussion discussion. I know it's a bit contentious and I apologize for that, but I think it's really important for our employees to have that passive enrollment. Thank you. Okay, we've had this discussion. Any more discussion? Mr. Marlin. Yeah, so Melissa, the 88 that didn't have um, health insurance in 2016, off the top of your head, you probably don't know, were those any repeat offenders in the 101 for the following year? I can only tell you that I'm only aware of one repeat offender ever, um, and that individual actually repeated in with this past open enrollment, so they would be in the um, 101. They had actually failed to enroll during their initial enrollment as a new hire, and then they failed to enroll during annual enrollment for January 1. So that's the only time I'm aware of someone that's failed. Ms. Hickerson. I've heard all of this and I just want to make a statement. We've been doing this a long time and open enrollment is every October. We don't change it from July to December and then back to January. It is every October. If you forget it once, you'd probably put it on your calendar and know about it for the next October. I am an employee. I do have one of the smaller departments, but everybody's the same and everybody gets the white envelope and the postcard. And if it doesn't go to that address, it goes back to Melissa and the Melissa's office says, hey, Mary or whoever, they didn't get this. And we get it to get to them still within the time frame. And it's not just open on October the 15th and close on October the 16th. It's bound near two whole weeks, if not more, that it's open. I know people are busy, and I'm part of the busy people, but it happens every October, and there's a day at a start and a day at an end. Just pick five minutes at the most, because all you've got to do is say yes or no to the insurance, to your health insurance. Nobody is that busy for two to two and a half weeks, whatever the open enrollment is. And like I said, it's every October. Mr. Sandvig. Well, I, I, my recollection is we issued about 6,800 W-2s this year. Uh, we have a lot of turnover, probably easily 600 a year. 
So we have a lot of people for whom it isn't an annual recurrence. But the, the first thought that came to my mind, our teachers, if they change address, have to change it three different places. Uh, just things like we, I get the irate and I get the desperate people like you get Melissa who, oh, I've changed that bank account. I've changed my address on that first check that is mailed. Uh, they move more than I would ever think is possible. Yeah, we have a lot of issues with people like that. And I don't mean to disparage them, but you know, uh, uh, a marriage, uh, for whatever reason, move and change. and. We, we don't get some of these communications out to some of those employees. We have a lot of employees, well actually we have now set everyone up with an email. We have a large subset of employees who really don't function very well with that technology in the year 2017. And I, 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 I see more advantages to the passive re-enrollment process for that because of that change over that we face. Just a couple pieces of information. I'm just giving you guys the, the picture here. You're ultimately decide the direction. And I thought about this after Ms. Hickerson said a few things. Um, intentionally, we drop the packages of information into the residents, employees' residents, during fall break for the Board of Ed. So that they get the information two weeks ahead of the annual enrollment period. We would continue to do that regardless if we go passive or active, but we do do that during the week that we know that the Board of Ed is closed for fall break. So we would continue that, that process as well. Um, and I had one other thought, and I can't recall what it is right now, but I will bring it up if I think about it. It's just about the ways that we do um, do communicate on it. And, and our people who aren't very uh, technically savvy generally aren't the ones who, um, generally aren't the ones that miss the annual enrollment period. Okay, more discussion. Mr. Marlin, one more bite at the apple. <laughs> I think this is a benefit, right? We call it a benefit. And um, it's not like it's, a paycheck where we're taking their paycheck away I mean it's, it's a benefit and it's something that that is if you lose it then you're not going to lose it the next year and I don't want anybody to lose their health insurance I surely wouldn't want to lose mine but I go in and do mine every year because my employer tells me I have to and I have to go to my associates and tell them hey you know you haven't done yours yet I get the emails and it sounds like there's been sent out that you know, you need to go do this, and shame on me or them for not doing it, whoever that person is. Just like retirement. If you don't look at your retirement, change your mix of funds or something every year, shame on you for not keeping up with, with it's your responsibility to go in and do that. And uh, I, I, I really think we're taking a step back, but I understand nobody wants to lose their health insurance, and I don't want anybody to lose their health insurance, but I think no matter what we do, we're not being good consumers. If you put it on autopilot and you go to the same gas station every day, but that gas station is 10 cents higher and you're not looking at your health plan because you're in a health plan that's higher than it needs to be, then it's, it's shame on you for not going in and just looking at it every year and making sure you're in the tune-up, you're getting a tune-up every year to make sure that you're looking at what you need to look at to make sure it's the correct plan for yourself. So that'll be my last time, Mayor. Okay, thank you. I think we're ready to vote. I d thank goodness I only got a small number of these calls. And not a single one of them had a reasonable excuse. They didn't have a medical emergency. They weren't in the hospital. They didn't have a family member there. They weren't out of the country for two weeks. Nothing except, and everyone that called me, they weren't the first timers. I was trying to find a way to find some way to have an appeals process, but all these folks had no justifiable appeal. The few that called me, thank goodness. We're ready to vote. Madam Secretary, call the roll. You're not prepared for that, I know, so I'll give you a bit of time. <laughs> so learning. This one? Yep. That's it. Okay. Uh, Rhonda Allen? Yes. Uh, Preble's not here, is she? Mm -mm. Okay, Paula Barnes? Yes. Okay. Susan Boney? Yes. Jim Bowles? Yes. Mayor Ernest Burgess? No. Christy Crowell? Yes. 
Joe Hafner? Yes. Mary Dickerson? No. Ricky Marlin? No. David Nipper? No. Jeff Sandman? Yes. Michelle Watson? No. And Shantae Sherrill? If you want to do three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay. 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 All of you that voted yes, let's find a way to make that 101 one of zero, okay? We're gonna do the same thing, but let's don't have anybody not completing their enrollment form. Let's put that as a, out as a challenge. Mr. Sandvik. And I, I know Ms. Street would like to see this, I agree with, I would like to see 100% of our employees who are eligible go in. Absolutely, but yeah, it's not happening yet. Okay, it's not a perfect world yet and it never will be, right? Okay, that's the end of that discussion for today. Now, let's see, Ms. Street has some other business here if you'll tell us about some other things there. All right, so I just wanna make an announcement that the June meeting um, will be canceled and our next meeting will be on August the 24th, 2017. What, is that August, you say? Mm -hmm. In August, right. We typically don't schedule one in July, so our next meeting would be in August. And then I gave you a note regarding the last one, Mayor. Is that the only two items you had? Yes, sir. Okay, so we very, very much appreciate uh, the many years of service of Ms. Barnes. And uh, she's smiling, but she's probably shed, already shed a few tears, I've been told. She is retiring this year, and we just want to say uh, how much we appreciate all the great things she's done for so many, many people, many, many young people. I uh, know firsthand about that. So thank you, Ms. Barnes. I appreciate that. And it's been a pleasure serving on this committee. I've learned quite a bit about insurance, more than I probably ever wanted to know. But I really appreciate it. I've made some good friends here, and I've, I've helped to serve the county and the, the employees that we have our, in our district. So thank you very much. Anyone else have any other business? If not, then we are adjourned. Thank you.